So a little bit of my professional background. When I finished my degree, I uh, thought, what the hell am I going to do? You know, there, was, there was really very little work out there in terms of resorts. There was, I think back in those days, there was TAA that I think had Hamilton Island or something. There was Uluru that had just been finished out there, but there wasn't a lot happening at all. But one day I was reading paper, as you do, back in 1985, and there was a thing called, I read this article on the Sheridan Mirage Port Douglas Resort, and a bloke called Christopher Scaife. Um, you know, and you know, I said it, 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 you know, it didn't end well for Chris and a whole range of other things, but all that aside, those early days, you know, when I read this article about this, uh, whatever it was, 350 hectare integrated resort being established in Port Douglas and one being put on the Gold Coast, I thought, you know, this is the group I want to work with. So the article went on to talk about a group called Media 5, who are the architects and planners. So I sent them a little, uh, in fact, I think I phoned them up and said, listen, I've just read your article. Can I come down there on the Gold Coast? I was in Brisbane. Can I come down and at least have a chat to you? Because this is what I want to do. So I took my thesis and off I went down to, down to Media 5. Um, now, late at night, we've got those dates are wrong. So it should be, uh, I think it should be 1985 to 1993. Um, they offered me a job there on the spot. You know, I had my thesis on planning criteria for tourist resorts. They had a 300 hectare resort roll out on the table. They said, come on down. So I came down there and had a fantastic, fantastic, how many years that was? Five or six or seven or eight years with Media 5, who at the time were really the, the preeminent resort developers, or sorry, resort architects and designers across the country. As part of that journey, I've had a number of mentors, something unique for Brisbane. There's this concept was always to put the buildings on the ground and put the park in the buildings and the buildings in the park. There's a lot of other proposals that had high-rise buildings in that, uh, in that, on that site, but there's wanted to lay the buildings down. And I think you know, the concept that, there's now, that, that is there now has achieved that. But what he said to me in the, in the role, he used to have a Rolls Royce, and the top down, we're driving back to the Gold Coast. He said, you know what Brisbane needs? And I said, no, Des, you tell me. He said, Brisbane needs a beach. So lo and behold, Brisbane got its beach. And, and through that process, I can still remember people just absolutely bagging Des for the sake of thinking, what are you doing, you Gold Coast architect? What are you put a beach in Brisbane for? But, you know, Des stick, stuck to his gun, he convinced them, and I think you know, at the end of the day it's one of Brisbane's greatest assets now is the beach that's been put in at South Bank. So, again, a great journey for me to be part of the visioning process. Great lesson is vision and the need to engage your stakeholders through visioning and through communication. And Des did that through slideshows, because that's kind of all it was back then, and the ability to talk to people and to entertain people. My first crash, and I've had a few of them, the, uh, the Japanese economic downturn. Um, it hit the Gold Coast extremely hard because we were doing a lot of work with the Japanese back then. Media 5 went from 200 staff down to 20 staff, you know, probably over a two year period. I was staff number 21, so I got, you know, I missed it by that much. In fact, I'm still very good friends with a lot of the, the guys and girls down there now. In fact, the guys that still remain are now the directors and owners of the company. I suppose if I was maybe number 20, I might, I might, have, I might be there with them. But I was 21, but um, that's all good because, you know, uh, you always have to look at opportunities. So what I decided to do after I was retrenched was start a new business. And I thought, hmm, is it a good time to do this or not? But what I found is that there's a lot of good people who were retrenched. So we started this little consortium, and we called it, or I called it, um, in the, um, the, the developers. So they're very much involved in the lifestyle community. So I saw my background as DBI as being a positive thing. What they were doing, they had got taken themselves up to Asia to ride the Asian boom. So, sorry, professional mentor number two, I need to remember these things. So Rob Johnson, who owned THC at the time, Rob gave me a great opportunity um, he really threw me in the deep end, and the thing that Rob taught me was the planning process, the need to follow a process. And if you follow a process nine times out of ten, you get a good result. It's amazing these days how often um, people don't follow processes because they're too, you know, they want to get to the outcome too quickly, and they forget about the 15 things that you have to do in between, and sometimes that leads to some challenges. So I keep reminding my staff because unfortunately the reality is, particularly with some of the young ones, they just want to go straight to the solution. They keep reminding them when every time a pilot lands a plane, he sits down and does his checklist. You know, does he feel he has to do it? No, but they do it because it's important, because there's a whole series of things you need to go through. So what Rob taught me was the planning process, and we certainly follow a lot of processes and what we do to ensure our outcomes uh, successful. Sumatra, they sent me off to Sumatra, which is a, or sent me off to Maidan up in rural Sumatra, and that was, Oh, that was 25 years ago. It was a bit of a backwater, but it was one of Indonesia's first integrated lifestyle golf course communities. Nick Fowle was the golf course architect. Um, that was the project. All of our projects in Indonesia were extremely large, and we were really riding the Indonesian boom. 
as it says there, six years, I was literally going to Indonesia twice a month. Lived on the Gold Coast, our officers were on the Gold Coast. Now we weren't going those planes, mind you, we were going in a much, a much older plane than that, but you know, the boys just popped, it would have been nice to be going in those planes. Um, uh, but no, it was an incredible six years. Worked on projects all over the Indonesian archipelago and formed a wonderful relationship with a lot of Indonesians. I still have a very close relationship with a lot of them up there. One of the interesting byproducts of my work in Indonesia is that I would often go into presentations, particularly in the early days, where there is very little in English spoken. So I'd roll out plans and drawings and try to communicate what we were trying to do. It was very, very hard, even though we had interpreters. So I guess that was also planted the seed for me, is there, there must be a better way to do this. And a little bit later we'll talk about that better way, which is all about visualisation. So again, lots of major projects in Indonesia, very large scale projects, and a lot of them are over a thousand hectares. Uh, all of these are built, um, or partially built, and they're still being built. That was a wonderful thing about Indonesia, is that we design stuff and they build it the next day. It was quite incredible. Not unusual to have 5,000 people on site building something. A little bit different to how we do things here. What might take 10 or 15 years here takes three or four years in other parts of the world. India is the same, China is the same. You know, there's an incredible um, rate of building that, goes, that, that, that went on during that boom. Great lesson number two, implementation. And these key words are going to come back and mean something shortly. So implementation, what I mean there is that we had to be very, very uh, aware of, as soon as we drew something, they started to build it. And so, in the early days, when we were playing with all the vision with DES, you know, there was, because it was in this country, it used to take so much, you know, we'd go through our approval processes, environmental processes, it would take a bit of time. Whereas up there, there was very little of that. So as soon as something was built, they'd be up, no, sorry, as soon as something was drawn, they'd be up building it. So, that kind of made me stop and think to say, geez, you know, we better take some serious you know, thought about what we're building here, particularly when it comes to slopes and, and roads and a few other things. So, uh, implementation was very important. Crash number two, the Indonesian crisis. Boy, did this happen quickly. The rupiah devalued from about 1,200 rupiah to the US dollar to about 13,000. It happened in about, you know, in a month. It was just overnight almost. So all of our fees, everything just stopped. Um, and unfortunately, as a part of that, my relationship with THG stopped. Um, and then I sat back and thought, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I've been back up in, been working in Indonesia, I've been working out of Australia for six years. I hadn't worked in an Australian, on an Australian project for six years. I then decided that what I needed to do to get back into the Australian market was to form a relationship with a group that had a strong presence, particularly in the Queensland market, and that group was PMM. Um, they've morphed and changed a few times now. Um, what are they now? RPS, I think, can you hear? They've got Connex and RPS, so they're, they're now a major international force. But, but back then they were a very good, um, a very good solid base for surveyors and planners, and uh, they provided a very good basis for me to re-enter the, the Australian market. We established a company called Avadi, which was my, um, I guess, key messages for how we design. So Avadi, and I have to go over and look at these because I can't remember, it was analysis, vision, academia, research, design and implementation. That was my journey of design, I suppose. I think I have another mentor here, Jim McNulty. Jim's uh, maybe known to some of you. He's a very prominent uh, Brisbane, Queensland based man. One of the things I loved about Jim in the early days was that he was always business focused. Um, and it was kind of nice to come from a design consultancy into, into, into a group that were very business focused. So Jim taught me an awful lot about business and that whilst it was, it was good to have design skills, it was pretty important to have good business skills. So then I needed to reacquaint myself with Australia. So back I came, even though I was living on the Gold Coast, I hadn't worked in Australia for about six or seven years and Jim and his team really provided a great outcome and a great opportunity. Around that time we formed, or I formed, I was fortunate enough to form a really lovely relationship with the Greg Norman group. Um, and a group called Medalist, who was the joint venture between Greg Norman and Macquarie Bank. And again, it was a little boom, semi-little boom in Australia where there was quite a few golfing resorts being developed and Greg was trying to establish his brand in this country and I was fortunate enough to get a gig with Macquarie and do, almost be involved with every single one of Greg's projects um, in this country for about six years. Some of them you may know, Brookwater up in Brisbane. Um, we were involved there for about 10 years. We still do little bits and pieces with Brookwater, Brookwater because most of our work was, was well and truly done from a planning point of view, but we still, still to this day do all their sales plans for them. Uh, Vintage is a golfing community down the Hunter Valley, um, once again still involved, and the great journey with me and my clients is that it's important for me to stay involved. Uh, both these projects uh, I've now been involved with for about 12 years, I guess 10 or 12 years. Um, so we're still very much involved with the, with the Vintage. Big project down the Gold Coast called Coomera Waters. Um, I've been involved there also for about uh, 
10 or so years. Not so much now, but certainly was a great, uh, a great opportunity and a great uh, example of the, the master planning work that we were involved with. Great lesson, business skills. As I said, Jim and, that, and the team really taught me business skills, which is incredibly important for me, particularly in some of these tough times we're having. Crash number three. So this is my own crash. I decided that I needed to leave the Vardy joint venture and start my own journey. Don't ask me why I felt that, but I did. And I guess uh, I just had some other things to do and I just felt a joint venture uh, in, a, in, the, in the form wasn't, wasn't working for me. So I left the joint venture arrangement and started V2I. A couple of key words in my life, vision and implementation. Um, very important to me. It's fantastic to have a vision, but unless you know how to implement it, it makes it very hard. 